Okay, much, much appreciated. And thank you to CSP as well. Now, Ari, we should also talk at some future point as my, my grandparents also owned a hotel in Usenberg. So this is a, truly a small world. Okay. Today, I'm going to try and answer a basic question. Uh, when and why did the clothing trade become a Jewish business? When did the Shmata trade become a Jewish business? And this question might seem nonsensical to those of you who are familiar with American Jewish history. Who does not know of Jewish sweatshop workers in the Lower East Side of New York or of national firms started by Jewish entrepreneurs that filled American wardrobes with cheap and sometimes very expensive clothing? All the countless mom and pop clothing businesses once run by Jews in small towns and big cities across the United States or of Jewish fashion designers who have changed how Americans have dressed. Surely you may be thinking Jews have always been central to the clothing trade in America. Not so, and far from it. Jews, in fact, were latecomers to the Schmutter business in America. There was barely a Jew in the front rank of the clothing trade well into the 19th century, really not until the 1850s, 1860s. The most important early innovators in the clothing trade, and those who really pioneered the American clothing trade, the mass production of clothing in America, were not Jews. Nor were the owners of the earliest department stores and the proprietors of the largest manufacturing plants. They were not Jewish either. Indeed, until the Civil War, Jews were only present really at the periphery, at the outskirts of the clothing trade. They were at most peddlers of clothing or small scale shopkeepers who sold clothing to rural customers. So Jews were really unimportant in the clothing trade and latecomers to the clothing trade until relatively late, really until the Civil War. The clothing business thrived long before Jews decided that it was a good way to earn a living. For much of American history, the clothing trade, in other words, was, was not a Jewish business. Today, my ambition is to describe when this changed and more importantly, why this change mattered. And as I'm going to argue, this change mattered a great deal, that the involvement of Jews in the clothing trade actually matters a lot to American Jewish history. The transformation of the clothing trade into the Jewish business par excellence, the business we associate perhaps more than any other with Jews, had all sorts of unexpected repercussions and consequences for American Jews. Schmutters, I'm going to suggest to you, really shaped American Jewish history in a way that has not been fully appreciated. But our story doesn't begin in New York City, but several thousand miles further east in Liverpool, in England, and not in 1881, but two decades earlier, in 1861, just after the Civil War had started. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but people sure. are seeing, I, I put up the slides and people say they can't see it. So I don't know whether people are looking at the wrong view or my view. So did, could you see the slide that I had up before? I can't see them now. But right, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna try share it again. And share let's, them again. Let's see if this In works. Fact, good timing, because this is the this is the first slide. So this is Liverpool Harbor, okay. Okay. 1861. So, can, so. Okay, can, can people see it now? Much better. Can people see it? You okay? Okay, there we go. Back to the so, story. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so this is 1861. This is Liverpool Harbor. This is not New York City. This is a long, a lot way, a long way further eastwards. So at dawn on Friday, May 10th of 1861, so this is less than a month after the Civil War had started, ships from across the world waited to dock in this bustling harbor, in Liverpool Harbor in England. This bustling port had once been the center of the slave trade. It had been made immensely wealthy by traders by merchants who had dispatched their vessels to, to slave ports along the West African coastline in the century before. But now Liverpool prospered by importing cotton, which was picked by slaves on plantations in the American South and was transformed into cloth in the factories of Lancashire, the factories which surrounded Liverpool. Weeks after the fall of Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor had signaled the beginning of the Civil War, many in Liverpool expected to soon be doing business with the Confederate States of America. And if they had known who was aboard one of the ships that arrived that day, the stevedores in this pro-Southern port city 
may have given one of the inconspicuous passengers who hurried ashore a hero's welcome. After disembarking Caleb Hughes, this passenger was in no mood to, to tarry. His voyage had taken far longer than anticipated, taken three weeks to cross the Atlantic. He was 31 years old and a West Point graduate, freshly commissioned as a major in the newly established Confederate Army. And been, he'd been dispatched to London on a secret mission. He was on his way to London, carrying on his young shoulders the knowledge that the task that awaited him might determine the fate of the Confederacy. Because although there was still tremendous excitement in the Confederacy in the weeks following the, the capture of Fort Sumter, away from the parades and celebrations in the Confederacy, the Confederate government was confronted with a very stark reality. In its rush to war, the Confederacy had little time to create the stockpiles needed to sustain armies in the field. And once it began to muster men into regiments, it quickly found itself at this massive disadvantage. Because at the beginning of the war, only a fraction of the nation's factories were based in the South, that, that the, the center of American manufacturing was very much in the North and what became the Union. In the 1850s, for example, the South imported more than two thirds of all its clothing, and it can, could barely provide a footwear for its soldiers, never mind uh, uniforms. The task that of outfitting this new Confederate army fell to a quartermaster's department, which was hurriedly cobbled together under the command of Abraham C. Myers, who we'll see in fact in the next slide. Uh, Abraham C. Myers uh, was the grandson of Charleston's, Charleston's first rabbi. This is him over here. In fact, Fort Myers is named uh, after him. Given the limitations of its manufacturing capacity, the Confederacy realized, and certainly Abraham C. Myers realized even sooner than ever anyone else, that it would need to, the Confederacy would need to rely on supplies imported from abroad if the Confederacy was to survive. So hence the dispatch of Caleb Hughes to London to begin purchasing the vast quantities of military supplies needed by the Confederacy. And he arrived really with very few instructions and considerable discretionary power to buy and ship goods to southern ports, basically buy as much as possible and send it across the Atlantic. But he had, he quickly discovered stiff competition from buyers from the Union, from the, the, the United States. Uh, and there, uh, you know, there was a case, was a case where he was quickly outcompeted. They, they had uh, exorbitant amounts of money and uh, his, the credit of the Confederacy was uncertain. No one knew whether the Confederacy would actually survive. So in desperation, he turned to a little known firm for assistance and we'll see the, the proprietors of this firm in the next slide. So began a fateful partnership that paired Caleb Hughes with uh, S. Isaac Campbell and Company. You can see I. Isaac Campbell on, uh, sorry, um, S. Isaacs on, on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, this is a firm, S. Isaac Campbell and Company, which began in the boot making business, but now devoted its entire attention to supplying the Confederacy. And uh, you know, again, Caleb Hughes didn't have any underlings of his own. He didn't have a support network. So he came to write almost entirely on this firm to act on his behalf. This firm was tremendously useful. They extended large amounts of credit at critical moments and, and offered their expertise in navigating the, the, the landscape of Britain. In other words, helping them to, to, to find uh, those in the arms industry who'd be willing to sell goods to, to, um, to the Confederacy, likewise sell uniforms and fabric and all sorts of other things. Um, and likewise, what this firm also did was to help bypass the northern blockade of southern ports. And you see this again in the next image, in the next slide. Uh, one of the, the, the first tactics employed by the, uh, was by the Union was to try and, and uh, uh, starve out the Confederacy uh, by blockading its major ports. So hence the need for blockade running to get by uh, this blockade. And this is something which, which this firm soon became quite skilled at. Whatever you may be asking yourselves, has any of this to do with Jews? You're right in thinking that Caleb Hughes is not a Jewish name, nor is Isaac Campbell and Company. While the very Protestant Caleb Hughes knew much more about musket balls than matzo balls, although the two are sometimes not dissimilar, Isaac Campbell and Company was actually a very Jewish business in a, 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 a very Jewish firm in a very Jewish business. 
And in fact, the, the, the firm's title was deliberately misleading. Uh, Dougal Forbes Campbell, the Scottish attorney who occasionally represented the firm, his largest service to the firm was providing a name for the masthead, Isaac Campbell and Company, which obscured the religion of the two brothers who really owned and ran the firm. Now, over the course of the war, these two brothers, Samuel and Saul Isaac, made a fortune by acting on behalf of Caleb Hughes and the Confederacy. And much of what they shipped uh, um, literally put clothing on the backs of Confederate soldiers uh, within the, on, on the field of battle. They sent boots and blankets and buttons and kit bags and millions of yards of fabric. And the next two slides show exactly this. They supplied also bullets and rifles and artillery pieces. I'm sorry if you go, yeah, go. So you can see that the sword over here inscribed with the mark of S. Campbell and Company and the next image, some of the other of many, many items that they, that they shipped uh, across uh, to, to uh, aid the Confederacy. Um, by 1863, uh, they were owed the astronomical sum of 515,000 pounds by one calculation over $300 million today and as one of the largest suppliers to the Confederacy. And without their assistance, the, the Confederacy may not have been able to fight as long and as hard as it did. In fact, you can see this, get some sense of it in the next slide, which is a letter sent by the uh, Secretary of, of State uh, by um, Judah P. Benjamin, the Jewish Secretary of State, a letter that he sent across the Atlantic to, um, to the, this firm to thank them uh, for their assistance. There was no accident that the Confederacy turned to Jews in London to supply their needs, particularly when it came to uniforms, because over the previous decades, over the previous two decades, Jews in England had come to dominate parts of the ready clothing market. The Jews and Schmatters have a very different history in England and the United States. And in England, they had done so through innovation. They really were the innovators, or many of the key innovators within the clothing trade in England, not so in America. A Jewish entrepreneurs, for example, in England, were early adopters of the sweating system. In other words, the system to use unskilled labor in place of expensive tailors to drive down the cost of producing clothing. The Isaac brothers were perfect examples of this. They'd actually made their fortunes initially in the boot business, again, using unskilled labor to, to mass manufacture cheap boots. And you can see this in, in, in the next slide. And this was true of, of uh, the, the clothing trade in London, that, that, um, that uh, Jews uh, made, uh, uh, many Jews made fortunes supplying inexpensive jackets and suits to London's growing, rapidly growing uh, population. And their greatest innovations were, were both in manufacturing and also in retailing. Uh, they, they came to develop a system which is familiar to us of, of rapid turnover and low profit margins, which is something which was new at the time. Again, producing lots and lots of clothing and, and selling it uh, then uh, relatively cheaply, which is something new that people prior to this point in time had had to buy expensive to tailored clothing or buy secondhand clothing. And likewise, the other area of innovation in London, you'll see this in the next slide, is also in, in developing the first, what we would think of as really as department stores, uh, that, that this is before department stores in Paris and New York, uh, many of the same sort of basic design elements, you know, gas lighting and large glass windows and, and ample room and things of this kind. Uh, this was also an innovation of these Jewish clothiers in, in London, something which is again, largely forgotten today. So it's no surprise again that Caleb Hughes, when he went in search of, of uniforms and fabric and cheap boots, that uh, Jews would be the ones who, who would be uh, able to supply him with, with what he needed. Ironically, however, uh, Samuel and Saul Isaac in London were not the only Jews who made fortunes as military contractors during the war. And here our story comes back to America, it comes back particularly to the Union. Because while the Isaac brothers specialized in supplying the Confederate army, their co-religionists, their fellow Jews in the United States did the same, supplying the Union Army. But if the Isaac brothers were an obvious choice for, the, for a Confederate agent in England, it's obvious that he would turn to Jewish firms because they, they were the major firms in England at the time, uh, it, it was much less obvious, much less predictable that Jews would be the beneficiaries when it came to the clothing trade in the North, in, in, in the Union. Because as I've already suggested to you, before the Civil War, Jews in the United States were at the periphery of the clothing trade, not at the center. Now, unlike Jews in England, where we had already had entered the trade, become dominant in the trade, Jews in America were, were, uh, were, were late to the trade. 
they were not amongst the leading clothing manufacturers. They really were rather unimportant if they were involved in manufacturing at all. The clothing trade was already well developed by 1861. Manufacturers in New York City dominated the trade and, and many of them were, were older firms like Brooks Brothers, uh, which had been around really since the 1820s. And again, had, had begun to produce mass quantities of, of clothing using the same sort of methods that we see in London. In other words, using the sweatshop system and using, uh, again, a high turnover, low margin uh, model. So mass producing clothing. Uh, for, for the common man. By contrast, uh, Jews uh, in, who had only really begun to immigrate to the United States in significant numbers in the 1840s and 1850s were newcomers to the business in, in America. Without capital and connections, many of, the, of these new Jewish immigrants, mostly who came from Central Europe, instead got their start, as I said, peddling fancy goods and notions and clothing to rural customers. And the next two slides are, are uh, typical of this, uh, again, demonstrate this more typical Jewish business at the time. It's sort of very petty retails that are uh, uh, traveling uh, in the countryside and selling uh, uh, goods to, to uh, farmers on, on the Western frontier. Again, you can see often selling to, to female customers in, in this image in particular. Um, uh, but again, this is peripheral. This is, this is not manufacturing. This is really selling uh, goods produced by others, selling clothing and dry goods and fabric produced by, by others. By 1860, some of these peddlers had uh, really completed this apprenticeship period, had completed the, the period of, of being a pack peddler, and had graduated to ownership of small clothing and dry goods stores, but again on a very, very small scale. So by 1860, before the war, in many rural towns in the South and the Midwest and the West, you do find Jewish owned clothing stores, but again, these are small scale as I've described to you. And uh, these uh, proprietors of these stores rely on these factories in New York and Cincinnati and elsewhere to supply them with, with cheap clothing. But those factory owners are certainly, uh, very few of them are Jewish by this, at this point in time. So how then did this change so dramatically? In 1860, Jewish peddlers and Jewish storekeepers were the customers of clothing factories and sweatshops owned and operated by non-Jews, as I've described to you. But 20 years later, in 1880, Jews actually owned those factories and sweatshops that supplied America with the bulk of its clothing. That is a transition, a transformation. Jews go from the periphery of the trade to really dominating the trade. So how does this happen? How did Jews come to dominate the ready-made clothing business in the United States? replacing, supplanting their non-Jewish rivals in less than two decades. What changes in this brief moment of time? What made this possible? And as we'll see, the Civil War decisively changed the clothing trade and with it the position of Jews and produced all sorts of consequences, a cascade of consequences that really have rippled down to the present day. This cas cascade began in 1860. It actually began the year before the Civil War started. Before the war, the single largest market for clothing manufactured in New York City and elsewhere in America was not the North, was not New York City itself or in other, other big cities, but actually the South. As I've suggested to you, as much as two thirds of all the clothing manufactured in New York City in the 1850s was sold to Southern customers. And this gives you a sense of the, profit, of the profitability of the cotton sold by Southern planters. So profitable was cotton that Southern customers had lots of money to spend on luxury goods and expensive outfits, as well as cheap clothing to outfit the slaves who worked on their plantations. So it's a, again, it's, it's, you get a sense here of how, how rich uh, this, the South was because of, of cotton, or certainly the white South was because of, of cotton. And given the scale of Southern demand, New York City, which was the center of America's clothing trade in 1860, became dependent on the South for custom, that that's where its profits were made. Every year, year upon year, Southern buyers flocked to New York City to purchase for the coming season, and a vast quantity of money flowed north as cotton was traded for consumer goods, particularly for clothing. This relationship between Northern clothing, manu man Northern clothing manufacturers and Southern customers was actually already well established before Jews began to arrive in America in substantial numbers. As I've described to you, Jews were relatively new to the clothing business, and they found it very difficult to muscle in. This was a business already well established, and this relationship between the South and the North, the, 
the relationship between New York City clothiers and clothing manufacturers and Southern customers was very well established. Again, much of it, almost all of it, dominated by non-Jewish firms at this point in time. Ironically, these same firms soon found that their dependence on Southern, on their, on southern customers was disastrous. Because in 1860, as America edged towards war, clothiers and dry goods merchants in New York began to watch the escalating political crisis with trepidation. Barring an unexpected turn of events, New York City appeared all but certain to be one of the largest losers if the South was to secede. It would be robbed of its largest market. It had come to depend on these relationships with Southern customers, Southern shops, keepers, Southern, a, a southern plantation owners, and if war was to come, almost certainly those relationships would be terminated. So as the national mood soured, manufacturers in New York City and retailers as well began to cut back on manufacturing and purchasing and prepared for a season of thrift. By the end of the year, by the end of 1860, this is before, well before the war has started, many clothing firms based in New York City were bankrupted by their Southern customers who suddenly refused to pay their bills and, can and canceled their orders in droves. So we see a collapse of the clothing industry in New York City, that mass layoffs, firms going bankrupt in a substantial way. This is a disaster for one of New York's major industries at the time. By April of 1861, when the war begins, the clothing business in New York City was decimated. And those who had dominated it, all these non-Jewish firms, were hit the hardest. And then suddenly and surprisingly, salvation. On April 15th, 1861, the day after Fort Sumter surrenders in Charleston Harbor, President Lincoln made his first call for mass enlistment. And at least in theory, each new soldier was entitled to an annual allowance of at least one cap and hat, two jackets, three flannel shirts, trousers and drawers, and four pairs of stockings and shoes. And you can see this, see these sort of uniforms in the next slide. Soldiers were relatively expensive to clothe. In fact, the cost of the annual clothing allowance for each soldier was double that of a rifle. You just sense of how expensive clothing is still at this time. And by the end of the war, most soldiers were wearing the, the distinctive clothing you see here. The top row of this image is the, 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 the uniforms, the distinctive uniforms of the Union Army. By that point in time, by, by, by the end of the war, most soldiers are wearing that you know, distinctive and, and uniform uniforms, uh, but not so in 1861. In 1861, in fact, we see in the next slide, there are all sorts of uniforms which are, which are manufactured, like the dashing fires away. It's this soldier with the, the, the quite bright and striking red clothing in front. Um, these were a, a unit comprised of, of New York firefighters known for their rowdiness. They grew on this brighter palette. Uh, they quickly discovered it's a very bad idea to wear red into battle. You, you, you draw attention to yourself as a soldier. Uh, so they too then soon uh, shifted to, to a, a, a more somber style of clothing. But whatever they wore in the spring and summer of 1861, whatever soldiers wore needed to be met, produced in great haste and great quantity. And this set enormous amounts of money rushing through and to the garment industry. The, the garment industry, as I described to you, was in a state of collapse that it, and many of the major firms were bankrupted and therefore were unable to take advantage of this deluge of money and, and orders. So who then manufactured all these uniforms? In the absence of the established manufacturers, those who knew how to produce clothing en masse but had gone bankrupt because of the loss of their Southern customers, the field was left open to ambitious newcomers. There was sudden opportunity for those with a lot of chutzpah and plenty of entrepreneurial drive. And the opportunity was enormous, just to give you a sense of the scale here. For example, the Union Army ordered 10 million pairs of trousers alone by the end of the war. Uh, remember that when the war began, the, the United States Army was 16,000 strong. By the end of the war, more than 2 million men had served in Union uniform, and all of them require uniforms. Someone has to make these uniforms. In the first year of the war, state governments, rather than the federal government, controlled procurement. And they, they held the purse strings wide open. They're just desperate for, for, to find someone able to, to manufacture uh, clothing, uniforms, tents, and all sorts of other things on their behalf. And those who are unfamiliar at this point in time with how business worked in state capitals quickly discovered that business was often conducted with a wink and a nod and a, 
and a, and a, and a, and a large gift. And a gift could play discrete dividends. For example, Joseph Seligman, uh, one of the brothers who would uh, form a famous banking firm, you know, Seligman Brothers, was sent to Albany to win contracts for the family's firm in 1861. The family had a relatively modest clothing firm in 1861, and but he wisely he uh, wisely gave the wife of the state treasurer a gift of a silk dress. And weeks later, unsurprisingly, the Seligmans were awarded contracts to manufacture thousands of uniforms. So over that, in fact, that first summer of the war, they manufactured um, tens of thousands of, of, of uniforms and had to ultimately employ two and a half thousand workers to fulfill their, their obligations. They became, in fact, the 11th largest supplier to the state of New York in, in, in 1861 on the, on the back of all these new orders. And what they were doing, by the way, was not at all unusual. This was when Jewish, non-Jewish uh, um, entrepreneurs were doing exactly the same thing that we know, in fact, that Brooks Brothers gave even larger bribes to, to, to the, the state of New York and got even larger contracts as, as a result. Uh, so the Jews were far from alone in pursuing such methods to win contracts, but this did not stop anti-Semites from claiming otherwise. And you see this in the next slide. And this is a common sort of cartoon that we see in newspapers in, um, in, in, in this year, in particular in 1861, this claim that, that Jews are snapping up all these contracts through fraudulent means and are trying to you know, make money rather than to serve uh, in, in the Union Army. So again, as I said, typical cartoon, there are lots of examples of this kind. Uh, as I said, not true, but this is common practice and Jews are just part of this, this much broader phenomenon. In the states that remained loyal to, to Lincoln, scores of Jewish businessmen, many of whom had, uh, had only given up the, the peddler's pack a handful of years before, set, set to sewing and stitching blue uniforms for the Union Army in quantities unprecedented in American history. So all of these entrepreneurs suddenly discover an opportunity here and seize it in many cases with both hands. So these Jewish dry goods merchants and clothing dealers and wholesalers and clothiers found themselves in the right industry with the right skills. At least they were familiar about where to purchase fabric and, and, and uh, again, they had some sense of the clothing trade. They found themselves suddenly mustered into service by the union's war economy, this desperate need to produce uniforms to clothe all these soldiers. In the Midwest, for example, many soldiers went off to war in uniforms supplied by Jewish firms, particularly in the Midwest. In Cincinnati, for example, several Jewish businessmen adopted a novel strategy that ensured that Jewish firms became the largest suppliers of uniforms to the Union Army. For in Cincinnati, former rivals banded together to form temporary alliances, enabling partners to pool their capital to purchase raw materials in bulk. It's difficult to get hold of the, the fabric you needed to manufacture uniforms. And they bid it collectively for contracts on the, on the national level. So again, this interesting example of Jews working together. These are former rivals working together. For example, the firm of Mack, Stadler and Glazer became the second largest supplier of uniforms to the entire Union Army in 1861. So again, think about the scale here. So hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uniforms manufactured in a very, very short space of time. We know that, for example, between August and December of 1861 alone, they manufactured over 200,000 articles of clothing for the infantry and the cavalry. And a local Jewish newspaper in Cincinnati crowed that the Union Army was marching off the wall with the mark of Mac on the uniforms, the Mac brothers uh, uh, symbol on, on, their, on the Union uniforms. But 1861 was just the start. In fact, uh, their, the orders that, these, that this firm received in the following years were even greater, triple in value in 1862, for example. This became one of the largest businesses in the country in 1862 on the back of all of these uniforms being manufactured uh, for uh, the Union Army. Of course, the Max are best remembered for their ill-fated partnership with Jesse Grant, the father of General Ulysses S. Grant, to smuggle Southern cotton northwards. And this was a speculative scheme intended to turn uh, spillial loyalties, their, their relationship with, with Jesse's relationship with his son, Ulysses, to best advantage. And several historians have, have argued that this venture, this relationship between the Mack brothers and Jesse Grant was the immediate cause of this infamous order issued by Ulysses uh, Grant, expelling Jews from the vast territory under his command. It's a shocking order he issues in December of 1862. And you can read a little bit more about it and see it in, in the next slide. 
While the Max and and many other uh, Jewish manufacturing firms made hay during the war, uh, more often than not, the the harvest, this tremendous amount of money suddenly being directed at uh, the, the, the clothing trade, fattened a multitude of other small businesses as well. So in other words, uh, Jews do particularly well because of their their relationship and their their familiarity with the clothing trade. In order to fill the the vast orders placed by quartermasters, large firms outsourced production to scores of subcontractors. For example, the Mack Brothers firm, Cincinnati, couldn't produce these clothing, all this clothing itself, so it instead passed these orders on to other firms, often to, to Jewish, small Jewish firms. And many of these small firms, again, were established by the Jews who until recently had been peddlers or run small dry goods and clothing stores. Before the war, there had been, as I said, at the margins of the clothing trade, really a toehold on the edge of the clothing trade. But now this demand for uniforms gave them a leg up and experience of mass manufacturing. They had to learn on the fly how to make uniforms for the Union Army. And by war's end, the result was that hundreds of Jewish entrepreneurs had gained the resources and the expertise and the experience and the skills to run small clothing factories. They had this this crash course in how to do exactly that. What impact then did this have in the long term on the economic position of Jews in America? What does this mean for American Jewish history? For some Jews, immense wartime profits provided a springboard into a variety of higher status occupations. So for example, I suspect many of you would have heard of you know, several famous banking houses, you know, the Abraham Kuhn and Sullivan Loeb, the bankers, Jesse and Joseph Seven, to name but a few. And the, they, these are individuals who not only earned a substantial financial reward from filling wartime contracts for manufacturing uniforms, but also these are people who did very well in, in, in manufacturing uniforms. They learned a variety of sophisticated financial skills in doing business with the government, that the federal government was very slow to pay its bills, so, they, so these you know, individuals, the, the Cones and Loeb's and the, the Seligmans, grew very sophisticated in matters of debt and risk. They had to again uh, you know, become very shrewd in matters of, of banking. And, and in fact, that becomes their platform for entering the, the banking trade during and after the war. The most significant legacy of the war for Jews, however, was this dramatic broadening of Jewish participation in the manufacturing of ready-made clothing. As I've described to you, Before the war, few Jews are manufacturers. After the war, Jews are dominant within several sectors of the ready-made clothing trade. And they have bank balances now swollen by wartime profits. And they quickly turn after the war from manufacturing uniforms. The demand for uniform disappears, or at least for military uniforms disappears. And they quickly move on to manufacturing clothing for the civilian market. And here they benefit from another major wartime development because the mass manufacturing of uniforms had resulted in a recorded scale of clothing management measurements for the first time in history. So it's suddenly a, a means to, 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 to quite reliably work out what clothing and what sizes uh, were, were most likely to, to be in demand. Because measurements of soldiers revealed that certain sets of measurements tend to, to recur with predictable regularity, allowing for the standardization of sizing it became the basis for the ready-made clothing business of the war. So this is, again, something learned by these manufacturers during the war. So as the market for civilian clothing boomed after the war and clothing became considerably cheaper, many Americans who had previously worn secondhand clothing now purchased new clothing. You get a sense of this in the next slide, how the, the market explodes after the war. The, the market for cheap ready-made clothing grew as never before in the 1870s. You can see, and uh, really in the 1870s and 1880s, you can see this, again, this innovation at work in these images in front of you. The promising vast profits, these new methods, these new innovations, for those able to mass manufacture clothing cheaply and distribute it efficiently. And once more, timing and location proved to be fortuitous for Jews. Because in the 1880s, some of those very same Jewish manufacturers who had entered the clothing trade during the Civil War now benefited from a tidal wave of Jewish immigrants who were arriving in New York City. These are people, for the most part, um, leaving from uh, Russia and, and Romania, beginning to arrive in very, very large numbers. These immigrants, uh, well, so the, these manufacturers, needed hardworking tailors and seamstresses willing to produce mountains of cheap clothing to satisfy this ever-increasing demand uh, for clothing from across the United States. 
And now these Eastern European Jewish immigrants arriving in ever greater numbers produced a willing low wage workforce. So, so in other words, the, 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 the labor required to, to fulfill this ever growing demand for, for clothing. And this became the basis of the garment industry on the Lower East Side of New York City, the single largest source of employment for immigrant Jews during the 1880s and 1890s. At the height of the garment industry in the Lower East Side of New York, it provided America with 90% of all of its new clothing. Again, gives you a sense of the scale of production which went on there. Again, these were Jewish manufacturers, uh, many of whom, as I said, who, who got their start during the Civil War, employing uh, and, and providing orders to these, these immigrants uh, who, who had newly arrived from Eastern Europe. Those immigrants who clustered on the Lower East Side entered an industry where Jews were already involved at all levels of the clothing trade. The Jews were involved in distribution, wholesaling, and manufacture of, of manufacturing of clothing. Uh, crucially, given the scale of demand, this tremendous demand for cheap clothing that had continued to grow at pace, there was plenty of opportunity for these newcomers to carve out space for themselves. And as these earlier immigrants, those who had made their fortunes in the 1860s, as they moved onward and upward in the clothing business, they created vacancies in the chain that were filled by these other Jews. In other words, as uh, Jews moved increasingly towards, as these an older generation of Jews moved increasingly towards uh, being large-scale manufacturers, large-scale wholesalers, large-scale retailers, there were all sorts of opportunities for these newcomers to replace them in the lower levels of the clothing trade. In the first two decades of the 20th century, it was relatively inexpensive and easy for an immigrant tailor and seamstress to strike out on their own and open their own sweatshops and workshops. It cost less than $100 to, to buy and rent the essential equipment required to set oneself up as an independent contractor within the clothing trade. As we well know, many new immigrants worked for others before becoming their own bosses and, and, and sewing and pressing alongside their, their hired workers. In fact, the clothing trade encouraged entrepreneurship. Why work for someone when you can scrape together the money to be your own boss? And equally important, and this part is less well known, the work, well, certainly this part is known, the work was difficult and hyper-competitive and unpredictable, but less well known is that, is how quickly Jews transitioned out of the clothing trade. Because as we know, the clothing trade was, as I said, difficult, hyper-competitive and unpredictable, there were long slack periods between season with little work to go around, as you can see in the next slide, and there were few protection for workers and little regulation in the industry. The effect in America was to persuade Jewish immigrants to leave this line of work as quickly as possible. This is the, the, the interesting and important detail. There was a continuous exodus of Jews from the sweatshop, seeking whatever, whatever other work they could find, that they were desperate to get out of the clothing trade and provided a foothold, a first rung on the ladder of success, but then they wanted to leave as quickly as they could. By the 1920s, Jews were outnumbered by Italians in the sweatshops of New York. The Jews were getting out, and Italians were taking their places. Why did this timing matter? If it was relatively easy to leave the sweatshops behind in the first two decades of the 20th century, things began to change dramatically thereafter. By the 1920s, sweatshops that produced menswear and womenswear were struggling to compete with factory-made clothing. Whereas once immigrants could aspire to open a sweatshop of their own, the startup costs of a small clothing factory, $2,000, were beyond their means. And wages were stagnant and declining too, making it difficult to raise the money needed to strike out on, on one's own. So in other words, Jews got in and into and out of the clothing trade at the right moment. The Italians who followed them got stuck in the clothing business. And they, they found it was a mobility trap. There was little hope of raising enough money to get out and little hope of becoming one's own boss. Not only was the exodus of Jews from garment manufacturing in America timely, so too was the, their entry into a variety of other fields in the first decades of the 20th century, when mass consumption was ballooning in the United States. Since several other sectors were averse to hiring Jews in the 1920s, 1930s, 1920s, 1920s, 1930s are a period of, of a quite extraordinary anti-Semitism in American society, rising anti-Semitism, this closes off all sorts of alternative economic pathways for Jews. In other words, they can't get jobs as teachers or as architects, or as engineers, and et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, many of them are, are, uh, are forced to, to become entrepreneurs again, to, to, to instead seek out new economic fields. And these fields, the film and music industries, cosmetics, household goods, turned out to be the industries that grew dramatically after the Second World War, as cons consumer demand again took off. You can see again, uh, the next slide is quite a telling one, 
This is the, the Brill Building in, in New York, and the Brill Building uh, you know, made famous as, as a center of, of the music industry in New York. Uh, it, the name actually comes from the owners of the building, the Brill Brothers, who operate a clothing store on the ground level. You can see it, see it over here. So again, it's interesting interconnection between Jews and these other uh, industries, again, between you know, where, where Jews leave clothing behind in many cases and instead go into all sorts of other fields. In turn, several of these new fields became Jewish niches, you know, Hollywood, entertainment more broadly, cosmetics, and parts of the, the household goods industry. These are areas where Jews did very well. So in other words, Jews got in at the ground floor of a variety of other industries that would boom in the 20th century. It's largely, or at least in part, it's because of, of anti-Semitism. They can't find you know, white-collar jobs, they're excluded from all sorts of white-collar industries. So instead they are become, you know, they follow their parents' example and become entrepreneurs. The beginnings of Jewish prosperity in the United States, in other words, was not wrought by magic and genius nor was it solely a product of Eastern European immigrants and their children. Much had occurred before their arrival to make their progress possible. To be properly understood, the ascent of Jews in the 20th century, the way that Jews go from being this poor immigrant population to being perhaps the most successful immigrant group in American history must be seen in the context of what I've described. There was nothing inevitable in this economic rise of Jews in the United States. There was all sorts of good fortune along the way, but certainly plenty of hard work too. As I've described, this good fortune began with the Civil War and then grew as Jews came to dominate the clothing trade. But for the Civil War and the collapse of the Southern market for clothing, there may never have been opportunity for Jews to rise to the top of the clothing trade. Yes, Jews had to work extremely hard without question, but they could not have moved ahead so quickly without schmutters. The relationship that developed between Jews and the clothing trade had long-term consequences for both. So in other words, the economic ascent of Jews, this way in which Jews become tremendously successful, can't be properly understood without understanding the business of stitching and setting clothing. And the garment industry cannot be understood without following the thread of Jewish involvement in the Schmutter business. So although Jews may have been responsible for making the modern clothing industry, without question, the clothing industry also made the Jews in America. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will unshare the screen and um, lots of questions are coming in. So yeah, it's pretty ironic that it takes a South African in Cape Town working with a former South African living in now California, nothing to do with it, <laughs> with the clothing business to do a program about the, the success of American Jews, which are probably most people online. I think Vivian Berger's from South Africa too. I don't recall, but or, <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, um, but most people online are, are, are American. So so many questions. Uh, where do we start? I guess the first is just a going back. Where did the Jews get the raw materials to succeed uh, in supplying the uniforms? Because they had to get they had to get the raw materials from somewhere, and it wasn't from the South anymore. It's it's a, it's a very good question, uh, and, and and this is uh, uniforms prior to the Civil War uh, are made out of of, of wool. Um, and uh, again, because it's believed to be more durable and, and uh, hardier given the climate and, and things of that kind. But there's a tremendous shortage of, of, of wool, as you, as you might imagine. Um, and likewise, obviously, the, the access to cotton uh, disappears as well. But the northern uh, factories in and in, in around Boston, particularly around Massachusetts, again, they, they're starved for cotton because of that same blockade that I talked about, about earlier. Um, so there's a tremendous shortage. And, and it, again, inspires innovations of, of good and bad kinds. Uh, there's a lot of, of corner cutting which, which takes place. Uh, certainly, again, Jews are perhaps at a slight advantage because they've been involved not so much in the supply of, of dry goods, of, of, of fabric, but certainly they have contacts in, in, in New York, some of them, uh, and, and Cincinnati, who are in that same business. They can try and, again, get hold of, 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 of the, the wooden fabric that's required. Instead, we see... In many cases, a, 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 as I said, a, a rather unfortunate innovation, which is the use of a fabric called shoddy to manufacture uniforms. So shoddy is actually the, the technical term for uh, wool, which has been broken down. So it's an old wooden garment and it would be broken down using a machine and, and used as insulation, stuffing for a jacket or for, for, for clothing, for anything else. But it wouldn't be used, wouldn't be reconstituted as fabric and, and used for a uniform. It's too low grade as the name later implies, it's, it's shoddy. Uh, in, in the early months of the war, because there's such a shortage of, uh, of, of fabric, particularly of this wool, which is required for uniforms, uh, 
uh, one of these non-Jewish firms, crucially, uh, comes up with a great idea of, of using shoddy illegally, illicitly, uh, to manufacture uniforms. So we see uniforms being manufactured out of shoddy. And then the, in the, the, again, the first summer of the war, there's a scandal in, in, the, uh, in the North. If you read Northern newspapers in the, in the summer of 1861, around these shoddy, shoddy uniforms, which the word basically moves from a, a being a description of fabric to, to, to be how we understand it. It's something which is low grade because these soldiers march off the war in these shoddy uniforms. And as soon as it rains, the shoddy uniforms collapse. So, so there are these descriptions that are sometimes amusing, sometimes not of these soldiers who, who find themselves half naked in the field because their the, the clothing has shrunk or the, the shoddy material literally has, has come apart. But again, it's, it's, uh, what, what happens is there's a vast amount of importation ultimately from, from, from Europe. So, so again, uh, from London and from, from uh, and elsewhere in Europe, um, a tremendous buying of fabric, much of the kind that I described with the with uh, with, with um, Caleb Hughes, uh, where where that comes to 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 sort of save the day ultimately. Uh, but again, the shoddy scandals of 1861 again often are applied to Jews. So, so the idea is that, that even though it's not true, that Jews are the ones who are responsible for crooking the army and providing all these substandard uniforms. Right, and when we say Jews, just to make sure we're talking about the German Jews because they're the ones who really came when we were in the United States in the 1850s. Um, were they also with the German Jews the ones who made the industry in England as well, or was that who, which Jewish population was that? Absolutely, it's a good, it's a good question. It's, it's a very much the same migration pattern. So, so um, in the case of, of uh, the United States, the, the, the American Jewish population grows very, very quickly uh, from the, the it's really the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, that the, the Jewish population by 1860 is about 150,000, whereas two decades before, it's, it's, it's a fraction of that. It's a very, very kind of condensed immigration from, these are German-speaking Jews from Central Europe. Uh, they, 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 some of them come from, there is no Germany at this point in time. They come from the German states, and they come from the Austrian Empire, and they, some of them come from Poland as well. Um, and, uh, and we see the same phenomenon in, in the UK, in, in Britain. Uh, in, in that case, there are though there's a, a more substantial Jewish population earlier, and, and th those are the ones who, who are the pioneers, they're the innovators in, in the clothing trade. That's why, in fact, that, that we see this the Jews far further ahead in the clothing trade in England uh, earlier than we do in, in the United States. And um, people have asked questions, but and you mentioned it though, who was financing these companies? I mean. You, you said that, that the, the barriers to entry, the capital barriers to entry were very low, so people could raise the money. But I think there were also banks, and they were the Jewish banks. And actually, they, they were, my, my understanding from reading is that, and you mentioned it maybe, that the families who were in the industry needed to create their own banks to finance this. And th that is the origin of many of the banks um, that we may know of today. Uh, Lehman Brothers, I think, is one of them, that they were involved in the in, in the clothing business created the banks because they couldn't get money from anybody else. And then that led to banking empires, correct? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a very, uh, absolutely what you describe is, is sort of part of this, this fascinating pattern where, where it's, uh, there isn't a, a investment banking system or culture in, in the United States as we know it. That really is in, in a significant part an innovation of these German Jews, the most successful of them. Some of them, as I described to you, come at it through the clothing trade and particularly these profits that they make during the Civil War. And, and again, the matter the matters of having to deal with government debt, because the government is extremely slow in paying its bills. So you have to become innovative in terms of understanding how to borrow, when to borrow, where to invest. Uh, others come at Lehman Brothers, an interesting case, they come through it for the, uh, from, from the cotton industry. Again, the same sort of thing where immense profits to be made in cotton, they quickly leave cotton behind. They, their customers, in the, they, their shopkeepers in the South, and their customers are paying them in, in cotton. And they decide, discover it's more profitable to trade cotton than it is to sell goods to their southern customers. They move into, into cotton trading and then into banking. But the same sort of discovery that there's uh, that, that uh, uh, this is an open industry, an open field, and, and if you're innovative, you can uh, you can get ahead. So they really invent investment banking. Did um, there's a question from Cynthia about the factories? Did the Jews end up owning the factories, the bigger factories that manufactured clothing? Um, so we so we see model. it different models in, in different cities. So so, so at New York, uh, there are larger uh, clothing factories. I mean, uh, you know, the the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist factories are a famous example of that. But it's one of many many uh, factories of that kind. But typically smaller in scale. New York, we typically see 
uh, a slightly different business model. It's, it's really a sweatshop-based model. It's a small, uh, small-scale manufacturing of that kind, but but uh, with lots and lots of sweatshops operating together in a competition with other. Other cities, for example, Chicago, that we, we see much more of a large factory phenomenon there. And it's, it's again, it's partly about timing, it's partly about what they manufacture so that Chicago becomes a, a center already of menswear of seat manufacturing. And, and again, that lends itself to, to a larger scale sort of factory style. So, so it's different in different places, uh, but, uh, but again, Jews are, are, are uh, um, uh, very much involved in, 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 this, uh, in, in both Chicago and New York and, and elsewhere to this, as I said, this really becomes the you know, uh, Jewish business par excellence. I mean, really the, the, uh, the, um, um, you know, the, the, the most common occupation by far for immigrants and, and, the, and the means of getting ahead in American society. Mary Kraft and Jeff Kaufman are some of our patrons who are in Boston. I don't know whether Mary or Jeff put the comment in, but they want to make sure we all understand not only did this this phenomenon that you talked about, the Jews getting into the, the rag trade, becoming successful because it, it was the right time, the right place, excluded from other places, Jews became very wealthy. But because of the structure of it, the Jews also became the leaders of the uh, unions and organized labor in reaction to the other Jews who were putting them in sweatshops. So if you look at American history, we've got the Jews, the capitalists, and the Jews supporting labor, and it all comes out, ties so nicely into your presentation. But you didn't mention that, so I wanted to bring that no, up. It's great. No, I absolutely am. I'm delighted that, that that's been, been brought up because, again, as you said, that's one of the lovely ironies of this is that we see uh, you know, the, the, the American Union, American labor movement uh, really gets going in a significant way or gets much of an impetus in the early 20th century from uh, these the people protesting the poor conditions in, in the sweatshops and demanding uh, better wages and things of that kind. And so again, because Jews are, are in a, the, the labor force, the dominant labor force in the sweatshops at the time, they become the, for a time, the dominant uh, you know, a force within the labor movement as well. So it's a, again, as you said, a lovely paradox. And uh, LD wants to know how department stores, how they connect to the story as well and the Jew famous Jewish department stores. In New York again a very again a very good question um, and and there we see a, a direct genesis a direct relationship between those um, uh, store owners the the, the the peddlers and their their children uh, you know in small towns and larger cities across the United States so so um, and, and there it's a case where where small businesses grow over time uh, those who, who who do well um, uh, and particularly in cities which are which are growing quickly, so so you know riches in in Atlanta as Atlanta grows, and, and we see the same in you know in, in parts of you know famous stores, Jewish owned department stores, and in in other centres, it's it's very much connected both with uh, with this intergenerational process and of children who take over their, their parents' businesses and, and expand them, and also with the expansion of these cities too. So again, that's one of the interesting avenues too. Uh, it's very much a phenomenon of these, at least initially, of these of the descendants of of German of Central European Jewish immigrants. That this is that, that's very much that phenomenon. Uh, and again, but it's extraordinary when you map out the number of of certainly large department stores, some of which become national, um, and and but likewise small stores in in you know uh, smaller towns in, in the Midwest and South. Again, the uh, often the dominant store in the town is a Jewish owned and uh, you know, a store, sometimes department store. Um, we only have a little bit of time left. Do, have, have you written a book about this subject? Like where, if people want to do follow-up reading, what do you recommend? Uh, so, so um, I have. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, the, the book, in fact, you described at the beginning called, called The Rag Race. It's really uh, looks at the, this, uh, these developments in uh, both the United States and in the British Empire. And there's an interesting sort of difference in trajectories in, in these different places that, that, as I described to you, American Jews begin later in the clothing trade in America, but actually become ultimately much more successful. That's the irony, is that they, they overtake Jews in Britain uh, in terms of wealth and mobility and success, uh, even though they start later. And, and so, the, so my book really uh, looks, looks at that. And, but then at the same time, there, there are all sorts of other uh, books uh, about the, the clothing trade, particularly in the 20th century. There's really, really little on what I've described, the, the, these 19th century origins. That, that's the, the novelty of, of much of my work. Uh, but in, in, in the 20th century, that there's again both first-hand experience, you know, accounts uh, of this, uh, but then quite a lively scholarly literature about the growth of unions and about the exp experience of, of, of you know, Jewish women in the sweatshops and all sorts of other topics of the kind. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good and lively field, and I'm happy to. If anyone wants suggestions, I'm happy to to send them your way. 
Um, does this history have any resonance to South Africa and the Jewish community of South Africa? Do, did our it, history come, did, were Jews of Africa involved in the same thing? Did they, were they successful in the clothing industry there? Yes, with an interesting variation in that uh, because of South Africa's racial dynamics, they, they weren't, they, they missed, or for the most part, skipped the sweatshop stage. They, they, they very much, again, were peddlers and storekeepers and, and then major clothing manufacturers. So the Cape Town in particular had a large clothing industry until about 20 years ago. It's been killed by Chinese imports, but it was very much, again, a, a, a Jewish business, the same sort of Jewish networks, very much Eastern European in, in, in origin. And, and manufacturing nationally, manufacturing for, uh, for sort of the broader South African market, you know, very successful. But again, Jews, there are some who remain, particularly in retail, um, uh, sort of some of the, the key, in fact, the, the largest uh, in a clothing retail chains in the country are still you know, owned, they're, they're public companies, but the, the dominant original shareholders are Jews. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, in, in many cases, as in the United States, that Jews have moved on to all sorts of, of other things as well, and particularly to the professions and sort of white collar occupations of, of all kinds. And um, we'll have to have you back because we really want to learn about why you went to America for 12 years, what you learned in America, and why you're like, what it must be like in South Africa to be the expert about this part of American history. And everyone's <laughs> asking you questions about South African history, but you're the expert in, in American history, American Jewish history. So I'll ask you just one last question. What do you miss most about your, from, from your stay in America that you can't get in South Africa? <laughs> And don't say chocolates because I think they're better in South Africa. Yeah, and and I, I should say family, uh, but um, I, I, my wife's family is all, all right in Boston. Uh, 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 very rapid Amazon deliveries. <laughs> no, I, I think I mean to me the the great beauty of of living in America was was how at home um, I, I felt in American society. I think this is it's it's difficult to appreciate as an outsider. Uh, as an insider, someone who's grown up there, maybe maybe you have that same experience, but but that sort of openness of American society uh, and sort of uh, you know, is something which 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 I, I again only really appreciate outside America again. Um, so so uh, I suppose that's a that, that that's that's probably what I miss most. Well, we really appreciate your outsider perspective of our insider history. Um, you know, <laughs> I do see South Africans here, so you know we'll ha we'll have to do a program with you about South Africa, if, if you have an, a topic on that. But I know, tell me, what's your other topic you like to talk about? Is it uh, Jews in the in the Union Army? Is that what you're- So, so certainly I've, I've just finished a book which will be published next year about, about what it's like to be a, a Jewish soldier in the Union Army. And it's Christian, very Christian space and experience and what, what is the day-to-day -day experience actually like. But, but also I uh, the, the, the center that I direct at the University of Cape Town, we, we focus on on, on South African Jews, and we do a lot of research. So if anyone's interested in that topic, that's also uh, what I can tell you about the, the past and the present and, and the future of, of, of this community as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I hope, I, I think, um, look, I've read books about this part of history, but the way you presented it was so clear and articulate and how you tied everything in. Um, it was terrific. I hope you all appreciated it. We'll have to read. Um, Adam's book. I'll, I'll share a follow in a follow-up email. I'll share with you all some follow-up materials about this program and books you can read. There's some great things out there. But um, yeah, I think that was a great way, a great understanding of of the success of the uh, American Jewish community based on, as you said, hard work, but a lot of luck, the right place at the right time. Um, and now I know about the Italians being stuck in the clothing business. So when I go buy my Italian suits, now I understand that way better. Uh, so. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. It's great seeing you. Have a great day. Lots of programs coming up with CSP. And I uh, hope you'll join us. Ada Class, Ada Class Gilbert, always good to see you. Martin Brower, Tamar Brower, nice to see you. Elise Podick. So we got many of our regulars. It was a big crowd today. It was uh, close to 500 people. Just want to make sure you know, Adam. So um, that's terrific. Uh, and I can see people from New York and California and all around the country. Everyone be safe. And uh, Vivian Berger, always nice to see you as well. So uh, if you're new to CSP, join us for more programs, occsp.net. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye.